Welcome back to Otaku Daikun. Dai here, and we're back for another chapter in the lore of Fate Grand Order. In this 29th video, we'll be covering Lost Belt 6.5, Realm of the Thanatos Impulse, Traum, Life and Death of an Illusion. This chapter takes us through a massive singularity in which servants wage war against each other to oppose proper human history, driven by an instinctive hatred provided by their mysterious master. As usual, this is a deep dive into the truth of things, and not merely a synopsis of events. I don't care if I have to spoil certain details, if it results in a more thorough understanding of what's actually going down. That said, it'll also be of use to anyone who felt the need to skip all of Traum's cutscenes. If you insist on seeing it play out linearly, you can always watch my livestream, where I walk through the game for the first time. With that disclaimer out of the way, let's dive in. To understand this chapter, it helps to revisit our old pal David Blue Book. When the alien god bleached Earth, David set out towards the one place that remained unaffected. That was Area 51 in the Nevada desert. Blue Book discovered that, basically, all of Fate Grand Order's conflict started with an alien encounter. The History Channel was right. This creepy creature, Subject E or Specimen E, crash-landed in New Mexico and was then taken to Area 51 for research. By research, I mean the scientists there performed all manner of screwed-up experiments on it while trying to resuscitate, communicate with, and preserve it. This tortured the poor creature, motivating it to send a distress signal that ultimately summoned the foreign or alien god we're now trying to defeat. Turns out, Specimen E can do more than just call for help. While the details aren't fully known, as this chapter ends on a cliffhanger, it's clear that Specimen E can function as a master, using not one, but three holy grails to summon an entire nation full of heroic spirits. Its hatred for humanity compels these servants to oppose proper human history by fighting one another. This results in a massive singularity that Caldea needs to resolve before moving on to the final Lost Belt in South America. Another thing that gets revealed here is the fact that Gaetia, the demon god hive mind responsible for incinerating human history, had a fairly reasonable motive for doing so. Turns out, even without Gaetia's involvement, humanity was always going to end thanks to the alien god. That's why, when Gaetia incinerated human history, it never went past the year 2019. Without humanity, there was no more history to consume. Thus, the incineration of humanity was a direct response to the alien god bleaching Earth, as Gaetia was trying to salvage what was left of humanity to go back in time and improve them. It was essentially trying to solve one apocalypse with another apocalypse. That's why we have what remains of Gaetia running around using Dr. Roman's appearance to warn Caldea of a traitor among their ranks. Eh, while we're on the topic, we might as well break that case right open. There's no simpler way to say it, Sherlock Holmes was the traitor. From the very beginning, he was summoned by the alien god as its first apostle and was instructed to serve as a double agent to help Caldea defeat Gaetia. Even if we can all agree that Gaetia needed to be dealt with, it's also true that it was trying to fight against the alien god in its own unique way. Going all the way back to the fourth singularity in London, Sherlock was summoned to help us overcome one crisis and then lead us into another. He arranged documents for us in London and met with us at the Atlas Institute during the Camelot singularity. This in itself was a red flag, since servants summoned by the counterforce aren't able to hop between singularities like that without a master. There's a catch to all of this, though, as not even Sherlock himself was aware of his own summoning. I mean, at first he was, but in order to truly and genuinely help Caldea, even through the Lost Belts, he tampered with his own memories. He betrayed his true nature as a detective who seeks to solve all mysteries by deliberately ignoring the mystery of his own summoning. The full extent of what the alien god ordered him to do is still unknown, but Sherlock avoided the compulsion to fulfill these orders through ignorance. To that extent, Sherlock never wanted to betray us, and actually did everything in his power to avoid doing so. By and large, he's helped us way more than hurt us, to the point where the alien god now sees him as a threat. 
In order to forcibly reawaken Sherlock's sealed memories, the alien god summoned yet another apostle, this time in the form of Sherlock's nemesis, James Moriarty. I dare to call him Moriarty Lily, given he's a younger version of Moriarty who had yet to even meet Sherlock. Like Rasputin and Muramasa, this Moriarty is a composite servant, and in this case, he's fused with the Norns, goddesses of fate from Norse mythology. In legend, the three Norns, Urther, Verdandi, and Skuld, provided water to Yggdrasil, the Tree of Life, while spinning threads of fate that bind humans to their destined futures. Moriarty uses their power to be a filthy cheater who, even when struck by attacks, ensures he's never actually hit by them. In his youth, Moriarty's an edgelord who owns up to his evil machinations even more than his older incarnation does. He only obeys the alien god in order to establish his superiority over Sherlock, but otherwise intends to become a traitor himself. His ultimate goal is to take over Caldea to spite Ritska, whom he believes is responsible for this whole mess. To that end, he's mostly an observer throughout this singularity, only chiming in when something interests him. I've got to say, the alien god really does suck at finding good help. All of this casts a shadow over the singularity itself, which is a pointless war of attrition between three factions. Let's go over them and their respective servants. Most aggressive is the Revenge Realm, led by Kriemhild. She's the wife of the famous hero Siegfried from the German poem Nibelungenlied. The two of them parallel the Scandinavian legends of Sigurd and Brynhildr. We covered Siegfried way back in Orléans, but since it's been a while, let's revisit him a bit. Siegfried is most known for slaying the massive dragon Fafnir. Its blood poured over his body, rendering him immortal everywhere except for a patch on his back that was covered by a single linden leaf. Siegfried's noble phantasm is Balmung, a treasured greatsword he received and defended from the Nibelungs. By all means, Siegfried was a beloved hero, but it was his steadfast dedication to his people that ultimately caused his downfall. You see, he barely lived for himself and was selfless to a fault. He accepted tasks without hesitation, always devoting himself to help others. Perhaps his most selfish endeavor was marrying the Burgundian prince Kriemhild. She loved him dearly, yet was jealous of his devotion to the people. She felt neglected, always treated as a lower priority. Eventually, Siegfried assisted his brother-in-law, King Gunther, in wooing the Icelandic queen Brunhilde. As a warrior herself, she demanded her suitors pass three trials, and instead of taking them on himself, Gunther had Siegfried, under a cloak of invisibility, pass the trials for him. Brunhilde eventually uncovered this deceit, and the dishonor nearly sparked a war between their respective nations. To prevent this, Siegfried became the Fall Guy, agreeing to his own assassination, which was carried out by his friend Hagen. Kriemhild, not knowing her husband volunteered to die for peace, retaliated against Burgundy. She got remarried to Etzel, aka Attila the Hun, and rebelled against her brother and Hagen. After 20 years of bloodshed, Kriemhild finally killed them with her husband's blade, and only then did she discover Siegfried's complacency. The man she loved, after a lifetime of setting her aside for the people, ultimately abandoned her for that same duty. As a heroic spirit, Kriemhild now hates Siegfried just as much as those who called for his death. She rules the Revenge Realm hoping that among the summoned servants, she can find her husband and slay him. Her hatred shines bright enough to motivate the largest of the three factions. Most of the servants in this singularity are lesser heroes, unnamed and presented with recycled assets. One of the more important figures, however, is the Chinese general Zhang Jue, otherwise known as Zhang Jiao of the Yellow Turban Rebellion. The late Han Dynasty was an era of Chinese history plagued with corruption. The Han Emperor's attendants abused their power for personal gain, resulting in the mistreatment of working-class peasants. Disease spread across the kingdom, coupled with poor farm yields, causing the masses to criticize that their emperor had lost his mandate of heaven. What faith they lost for the government was rekindled by Zhang Jue, a Taoist sorcerer who practiced faith healing. 
He founded the Yellow Turban Rebellion, which cast the Han Dynasty into chaos, resulting in what we now call the Three Kingdoms period. In this chapter of FGO, he was actually the first servant summoned by Specimen E, as well as the catalyst through which the singularity was made. His real body guards the entrance to Area 51, and to participate in the conflict, he relies on duplicate bodies that crumble into sand the moment they realize they aren't the genuine article. Using this method, Zhang Jue swears fealty to Creamhield, mainly because her thirst for revenge is great at fueling the flames of war. Knowing she wants to reunite with Siegfried, Zhang Jue has taken measures to ensure that the Siegfried summoned into Traum is locked away and hidden in a temple guarded by Taoist arts. My favorite servant this time around is Salome, or Salome III. She was a Jewish princess, the granddaughter of Herod the Great, and direct child of Princess Herodias. After her mother remarried, Salome became the stepdaughter of Herod Antipas. At the time, a Jewish preacher named Yohanan, or John the Baptist, was a prominent figure throughout the Roman Empire. Most notably, he was a prophet who foretold the coming of Jesus, and is even documented as the one who baptized Christ. John criticized Herod Antipas's marriage to Herodias, namely because he divorced his former spouse to unlawfully wed his brother's wife. As punishment for this slander, Antipas had John locked away as a prisoner. During his captivity, he met Salome, who fell in love with him during their interactions. Perhaps more than love, it was obsession or infatuation. She tried to woo John, begging to touch and kiss him. He, however, rejected her as a daughter of Sodom. For his birthday celebration, Herod Antipas asked Salome to dance for him, offering her anything she wanted as a gift. Her request, the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter. Herod opposed this, noting John as a holy man. His wife Herodias, on the other hand, was delighted to see her most vocal critic silenced. In either case, Salome performed the seductive dance of seven veils, during which she removed her seven layers one at a time. Herod was a total perv and had feelings for his own stepdaughter, and so he was desperate to see her practically nude. Since she fulfilled her promise, it was now his turn. When John's head was eventually brought before her, she kissed it as though he were still alive. Not gonna lie, she's a psycho. And while I know you're not supposed to stick your dick in crazy, she's hella fine. As a member of the Revenge Realm, she acts loyal enough for a berserker. That said, thanks to her legend, she's compelled to see anyone she gets intimate with as her beloved Yohanan. Succumbing to this urge will have her beheading those she cherishes. This realm also features two prominent Archer-class servants. First, we have Sugitani Zenjubo. He was an expert sniper during the Sengoku period who was hired to assassinate Oda Nobunaga. During a retreat back to his domain in Gifu, Nobunaga was forced to travel Chikusa Mountain, where Sugitani concealed himself. Sugitani took two shots with his arquebus, and despite his remarkable talent, these bullets only scratched Nobu. Having failed, Sugitani went into hiding. Note that I've been saying he, though the art is clearly of a girl. That's because he sought aid from the Fuma Ninja Clan, specifically the dark mage Kashin Koji, who created our robo-milf Kato Danzo. Kashin Koji, who could also gender-bend herself, helped disguise Sugitani by turning him female. Regardless, Sugitani was captured and taken to Gifu, where Nobunaga had her executed in a rather morbid fashion. Buried in the ground up to her neck, she was abandoned for passers-by to slowly slice her head off with a dull bamboo saw. As a heroic spirit, she joins the Revenge Realm while secretly supporting proper human history. She obeys her orders for now, but is waiting for the chance to betray them. The Revenge Realm's secret weapon is Minamoto no Tametomo, who in fate is a literal mecha samurai. The Minamoto clan, known for its many heroes like Raiko, Ushiwakamaru, and her brother Yoritomo throughout the years, came across a piece of Atlantean wreckage from none other than Ares, the Greek god of war. 
The clan took this wreckage and made it into the Setsu Armor Kumano, aka Golden Huge Bear. But with the remaining parts, they built an Oni slaying warrior named Tametomo. That said, before he could be completed, he was put into storage, as the Oni population had already dropped considerably. He was eventually brought back as a samurai with modifications to his original design. Despite being a robot, he was treated as any other human, historically documented as the son of Minamoto no Tameyoshi. His skill in archery was unrivaled, causing family drama that ultimately had him banished to Kyushu. Despite this, he would later join his father on the Emperor's side of the Hogan Rebellion. Unfortunately, their side lost, leading to Tameyoshi's execution and Tametomo's exile. Tametomo then spent the rest of his life plundering nearby islands, until pressure from the imperial court led him to self-destruct. In a way, his circumstances are a lot like Xiang Yu's, as they were both machines who lived as ordinary people. Creamhild's revenge realm keeps him sealed off, only ever summoned to specially built siege towers that siphon mana from the Singularity's ley lines. In that regard, he's exploited exclusively for his noble phantasm, which during his lifetime sunk an entire warship with a single arrow. Basically, Revenge Realm casters call upon him to fire off devastating long-range attacks before putting him back to sleep. They just tell him where to shoot, and he does so without question. Our final Revenge Servant worth mentioning briefly is Hassan of the Hundred Faces. We've already covered these guys before, but this time around, it seems Zide the Base leads the group instead of its usual main, Asako. So that's one side of this enormous conflict. The other happens to be the Reinstatement Realm, commanded by Emperor Constantine XI. He was the final Emperor of the Byzantine, or Eastern Roman Empire. He had the unfortunate role of inheriting what was already a crumbling nation. Regardless, he fought valiantly to protect Constantinople from being invaded by the Ottoman Empire. His palace was in disarray, and before he could repair it, he found himself facing off against the Sultan Mehmed II. Rather than submit to invasion, Constantinos chose to defend his keep with a humbling army of soldiers and mercenaries. Even though he only had around 7,000 troops, to Mehmed's army of 100,000, he was able to hold off the enemy for two months. The three layered walls of Constantinople manifest as his noble phantasm, Theodosios Constantinos, which greatly resembles Mashu's Lord Camelot. While he inherits a disdain for human history from his master, Specimen E, Constantine has a much more personal reason to fight. That would be Johanna, or Pope Joan. Legends tell of a woman in the 9th century who, like Joan of Arc, pretended to be a man. This was so she could enter the Catholic priesthood and ultimately become the Pope for a time. Her accomplishments were a subversion of the Church's strict patriarchy, or at least they would have been if she were real. After years of scholarly research, it's widely accepted that the legends of Pope Joan were entirely fictional. Mind you, this has never stopped folks from becoming heroic spirits before. There are various ways that mere legends or stories can still be recorded in the throne of heroes, with examples being Sherlock Holmes and Kojiro Sasaki. Just because it can happen, though, that doesn't mean it's well received. In Johanna's case, she found herself summoned to Traum, where she quickly realized she never actually existed in reality. She found this cruel and insulting. How dare humanity refute her existence? How dare they bring life to a mere figment of their imagination? These conflicting thoughts motivate her hatred of proper human history, and when she expressed these feelings to Constantine, he decided to establish the reinstatement realm as a means of fighting against history, with the hope of rewriting it such that she does exist. It's irrational for sure, yet also quite endearing. It's obvious that Constantine has fallen for Johanna, and while she feels the same, her duty as Pope prevents her from realizing it. Now, we don't actually see a lot of important heroic spirits in this realm. One of them, though, is Kiyohime, whom we've already covered in the past. 
As a quick refresher, though, Kiyohime was a young girl who fell in love with a monk named Anchin, who promised her he would come back to visit her. Despite this, he never did, spurring Kiyohime into a hateful rage. She became a dragon who found and cooked him inside a large bell. Long story short, she hates liars and is unstable as fuck. The Lancer servant Bradamante also sides with Johanna for a time, but I'd prefer to swing back around to her in just a bit. You'll see why. Originally, it was just these two realms fighting each other, but a third realm later emerged through some strange circumstances. To understand this, we've got to go back to the Olympus Lost Belt, more specifically the Atlantis chapter. Before Caldea ever arrived to that Lost Belt, the Counterforce summoned a ton of servants to help clear a path to Olympus. This put them at odds with the machine body of Artemis, which devastated nearly all of them. Only a select few servants actually made it to Olympus because of her. Turns out, one of the servants summoned by the planet was the wannabe knight Don Quixote de la Mancha. This old man, Alonso Quijano, is the main character from Miguel de Cervantes' famous 17th century novel. In it, Don Quixote was an eccentric hidalgo so obsessed with tales of knights and chivalry that he went off the rails, selling his land to pursue his dream of becoming a knight errand. He convinced himself he was a knight, and along with his squire, Sancho Panza, and his frail horse, Rocinante, he went on adventures in the countryside. He charged at windmills, mistaking them for giants. He pursued the daughters of farmhands, mistaking them for princesses. Those around him became aware of his delusions, either trying to cure or toy with his fantasies. Altisidora, for instance, was a prankster who pretended to fall in love with Don Quixote and tempt his libido. Instead, however, he remained faithful to his made-up princess Dulcinea. Ultimately, though, Alonso breaks free of his delusions due to nearly dying from a fever. While he did recognize the silliness of his adventures, he cherished the virtues they were inspired by. As a heroic spirit, Don Quixote manifests along with a hybrid companion that is, all at the same time, his friend Sancho, his horse Rocinante, Altisidora, and his beloved Dulcinea. At first, he was honored to fight alongside great heroes for the benefit of proper human history, but when Heracles got roasted by Artemis' orbital laser, he chose to flee. His noble phantasm, Triste Suave Alonso Quijano, this cruel yet kind reality, reduces mystery and magecraft by imposing upon the world the reality of 17th century Spain. With it, he escaped the Olympus Lost Belt and wound up in this singularity instead. His choice to abandon the fight comes to haunt him, and so within Traum, he wants to redeem himself. Problem is, he's one of the only proper human history servants in a swarm of heroes who oppose it. Thus, Sancho gets the idea to play along and form their own army. Over time, they hope to find more sympathizers and foster a realm that can welcome Caldea when they arrive. In order to rally servants to their side, Don Quixote pretends to be Carl de Grossa or Charles the Great, the most famous leader of Western Europe. He hides behind a veil, using Sancho as his liaison to the people. He builds up his righteous realm through guerrilla warfare, hoping that one day the real Charles will show up and take over. Turns out, Charles is present here, but it's complicated. Charles, or Charlemagne, was first introduced during Fate Extella Link, where he was split into two separate parts. In real life, Charles was a Frankish king who united most of Western and Central Europe during the late 8th century. He even became the first emperor to take over after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. His rule brought about the Carolinian Renaissance, a period of profound cultural development. While he was a real-life dude, he was so famous that people started to ascribe to him many legendary adventures similar to King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. Those exploits are, at best, tremendous exaggerations. To that end, it's possible for Charles to manifest in either his more realistic state, as seen here, or as his more adventurous side. The one that shows up in Traum is the Charlemagne of legend, known for adventuring with his twelve paladins. 
In this form, he is reckless and naive, motivated primarily by what he thinks is cool or awesome. I can only imagine what it would be like for him to get summoned by Ryunosuke from Fate Zero. Ugh. Anyway, our boy Charlie is only here as a result of his other paladins getting summoned. He wasn't called by Specimen E, the Grail, or the Counterforce. This has left his spirit origin in shambles, such that he can only activate his Holy Sword Joyeuse a handful of times. He's gotta conserve his power just to stay summoned, and as a result, he chooses to spend most of the singularity in disguise. He's waiting for the opportune moment to reveal himself and save the day. Before that, though, he's captured by the Revenge Realm and locked away beneath Creamhild's palace. So, I mentioned he was chain summoned along with other paladins, of which there are three that appear in this chapter. First is Astolfo, the one we're most familiar with. He's a whimsical figure who's known for his lack of sanity, which he left behind on the moon. He rides a hippogriff and makes use of several noble phantasms acquired from his various adventures. He's got a grimoire that resists magic, a horn that blasts away his enemies, and a lance, the Trap of Argalia, that forces foes to fall over. He once dressed up as a girl to calm his cousin Roland, who happens to be our next servant. Also known as Orlando, Roland is the leader of Charlemagne's paladins. He wields the Durendal, the same blade once used by Hector during the Trojan War and later used by Mandricardo, whom we met in Atlantis. He's perhaps most famous for his tantrum in the story Orlando Furioso, in which he fell for and was rejected by the beautiful Queen Angelica. He went into a rage, tearing off his clothes and trouncing around in the nude. This is what prompted Astolfo to travel to the moon in the first place. The two of them share a deep friendship, and together, they both perished in the bloody battle of Roncheval Pass. In this singularity, they happen to be two of the few servants summoned by the counterforce. They agree to Don Quixote's plan of faking Charlemagne, acknowledging that the real Charles wouldn't take issue with someone impersonating him for a good cause. As such, they're in on the facade and help to preserve the secret that their righteous realm is actually supporting proper human history. Their other cousin and fellow paladin Bradamante is also summoned to the singularity. In life, she gifted Astolfo his hippogriff and inherited Astolfo's trap of Argalia for herself. She was a descendant of Hector, renowned as the Knight of the White Plume. In addition to serving as a paladin, she was also a princess who fell in love with Ruggiero, a knight from an opposing nation. Many of her adventures involve rescuing him from the clutches of evil, such that her servant form is destined to always be seeking him out in futility. When she summoned this singularity, she suspects that Charles the Great is an imposter, opting to join Johanna's reinstatement realm instead. She hopes to support the blossoming love between Joan and Constantinos. Luckily, the Righteous Realm has other supporters it can rely on, such as Dirmuda Dubna and his saber form. We already covered him back in E Pluribus Unum, so I won't sweat the details here. The final servant of note happens to be Lady Shu Fu, who was introduced in a summer event I have yet to cover. During China's Qin Dynasty, Shu Fu was an alchemist hired by Emperor Qin Shi Huang to discover the key to immortality. History records her as a man, which she assumes was the result of bureaucrats not wanting to admit the Emperor would seek a woman's help. She has a perfectly justified obsession with Yu Mei Ren, one that had her spirit origin split into both archer and caster forms. Rather than search for immortality like she was supposed to, Shu Fu instead used the Emperor's resources, trying to find a way for Consort Yu to finally die. That summer event revolved around Shu Fu creating a mask inscribed with all kinds of murder. It was strengthened each time Yu Mei Ren died and resurrected. In this singularity, what's most important are her talents in Taoist magecraft. Despite her self-conscious, non-committal attitude, she's the only servant capable of countering Zhang Jue's Taoist arts. To that end, she is an indispensable asset to the Righteous Realm. So, before we move on to the synopsis, let's summarize everything thus far. In essence, the lingering presence of Specimen E creates a singularity hell-bent on opposing proper human history. 
While E's abilities aren't exactly clear, we know it has the power of three holy grails, and it uses them to summon hundreds upon thousands of heroic spirits. These spirits are instinctively compelled to hate proper human history and oppose it by battling each other in perpetuity. There are three separate factions, or realms, that wage war on one another. There's the Revenge Realm, led by Krimhild and her desire to punish her husband Siegfried. There's the Reinstatement Realm, which is secretly dedicated to rewriting history so that Pope Joan actually exists. Then we have the Righteous Realm, which is started by Don Quixote out of guilt for abandoning the fight in Atlantis. Sherlock Holmes is unknowingly the very first of the alien god's apostles, but since he's erased his own memories, the alien god has summoned a rival apostle, James Moriarty, to defeat him. Moriarty watches over the singularity, not really caring who wins, so long as he can best Sherlock and reveal to him the truth. Since the incident at the end of Tunguska, we've had to abandon our home at the Wandering Sea, surviving solely within the storm border. The border's been flying over Eurasia, making pit stops to gather energy. The Arctic Circle wound up being the safest place to hide from the alien god's watchful eye. As if things couldn't get worse, this Traum singularity emerges, prompting us into action. Before we can head to South America and enter the final Lost Belt, we need to take care of this singularity first. While Ritska can always summon Shadow Servants for individual fights, they can only bring three permanent servants along for the Ray Shift. On our side is Sherlock Holmes, as well as Vlad III, whom I introduced back in Orléans. Vlad is chosen for his strategic expertise, which we'll need to participate in the war effort. We want Mashu to tag along as well, but she can't while her Ortonax is undergoing maintenance. Thus, the plan is to go with only two servants at first, and Mashu will ray shift as soon as she can. In a surprising twist, Ritska isn't the only master to go along for the ride. Kadix Zemlipus, whom we've had in custody for a while now, is finally all healed up. He claims to have given up on the cryptors, and agrees to help Ritska going forward. Aside from summoning servants, Ritska is not that talented as a mage, so having Kadik around will be extremely helpful. To keep him in check, Da Vinci has installed a collar around his neck that detects unapproved spells. If Kadik tries anything suspicious without permission, the collar will fry his magic circuits and likely kill him on the spot. Accepting this, Kadik begrudgingly joins the infiltration team. What he doesn't realize is that he's got a special someone helping him out from beyond the grave. Recall that Kadik's servant was Anastasia, who took a gunshot wound for him at the end of the Russian Lost Belt. Before dying, she made a wish to her spirit familiar V to look after Kadik in her place. Ever since, Kadik's had V watching over him. He unintentionally senses this in the form of chills up his spine. V happens to have mystic eyes of clairvoyance, which it can temporarily transfer to Kadok or his other allies. It's also worth noting that Kadok still has his Sirius Light, the special command spell given to members of Team A as a last resort. Sion tried to remove the damn thing, but couldn't. Thankfully, Kadok's a good boy, for now at least. He's willing to tolerate Ritska, but finds their lack of genuine knowledge on Magecraft insulting. Still, he can hardly complain. His family specialized in anti-beast magecraft, and since there are fewer beasts around as time moves on, his future prospects suck. That said, even the basic spells he can conjure are more than Ritska can manage. Aside from mystic codes, Ritska's really only good for summoning lots of servants and supplying them mana. A nice gig if I do say so myself. Our ray shift works, though Mashu detects a strange fluctuation that the others feel midway. We first discover a town that was made entirely by casters for the sake of being a battleground. It is completely destroyed with no sign that anyone actually lived there. Enemy troops march into the area, prompting Ritska and Kadok to hide in a makeshift hole. The same pattern plays out with each skirmish. The Revenge and Reinstatement Realms duke it out, and at the last minute, the Righteous Realm swoops in to reap the spoils. After being ambushed by assassins, we notice that all of these many heroic spirits are empowered by command spells. At this point, though, we're unaware of Specimen E and what it's capable of. 
Unlike other lost belts and singularities, there are no normal towns we can visit for information. Instead, Moriarty shows up to flex his invincibility on us. Beyond that, he has the power to compel other servants to reject proper human history, essentially converting them to his side. Moriarty tries this on Vlad, but the renowned Impaler opts to stop this by impaling himself. Surprisingly, this doesn't kill him, but it does put him out of commission for a while. Ritzka, Kadok, and Holmes run away, having lost a party member right off the bat. You know what they say, though, out of the frying pan, into the fire. Not long after making our escape, we are ambushed by Zhang Jue, who uses his Taoist arts to capture Ritzka. Holmes and Kadok aren't strong enough to fight back and are forced to flee, leaving Ritzka to their fate. Mashu is desperate to hop in and rescue her master, but eventually settles down when Da Vinci points out they can still track Ritzka's vitals. Sure enough, Caldea's master is merely transported back to the Revenge Realm for interrogation. I mean, Creamhield wants to execute Ritzka, while Zhang Jue wants to torture them, so they still need a quick rescue. Fortunately, the future prediction lens Sheba, which is now installed directly on the border, estimates Ritzka should be alive for the next few days. Without any leads, Kadok and Holmes choose to visit the reinstatement realm, given that the Righteous Realm is harder to find, well concealed within a mountainous region. That and Holmes is curious what reinstatement is referring to. Meanwhile, Ritzka is carted off to the Revenge Realm, which is marked by the ominous red sky looming over its territory. After pissing off Creamhild for merely existing, Ritzka is locked away in the dungeon. There, we meet Charlemagne, who is hiding his identity under the alias Seton. At the reinstatement realm, it doesn't take long for Sherlock and Kadok to be sniffed out by Constantine. He's about to pursue them, but then Johanna pulls them into her church. While Constantine would want them murdered on the spot, she is more diplomatic, offering Sherlock information while trying to understand Caldea's situation. While this is very helpful, their discussion is interrupted when Constantine barges in. Johanna calls off a group of assassins, letting Holmes and Kadok escape. She then assures Constantine that they aren't a threat and claims to have been probing information out of them. What she doesn't disclose is the fact that, despite Constantine's efforts to reinstate her into proper human history, she actually doubts that will ever happen. Her uncertainty prompts her to go easy on Caldea, which is something we desperately need right now. Noting they made a bad call visiting enemy territory, they then set their sights on the Righteous Realm, hoping for better luck. Back in the Revenge Realm, Ritzka and Seton chat between cells, until we get a surprise visit from Salome. She's curious about Ritzka and offers to bring them food in exchange for stories about their adventures. Her interest in Ritzka is suspiciously similar to how she developed an affection toward John the Baptist. Even so, we'll take help whenever possible. For example, when Zhang Jue comes to our cell to torture us, Salome defends us, killing his retainers and chasing him off. After hearing about this, Creamhild suspects Salome will start to view Ritzka as her beloved Yohanan and orders some extra servants to monitor their interactions. In life, Salome was a pampered princess, so she actually has no experience preparing food for Ritzka. Even so, she slaves over cutting an apple, presenting it sloppily yet sincerely. Ritzka eats it without complaint, and the kinder they get, the more she starts to compare them to John the Baptist. Sherlock and Kadok, on the other hand, travel westward, scaling mountains and navigating a network of bounded fields that Shu Fu likely erected. When they're attacked by monsters en route, Astolfo shows up, using his horn, La Black Luna, to rescue them. He's on orders to bring them back to his kingdom, but like a total scatterbrain, he forgets to offer them a ride on his hippogriff. Regardless, Sherlock and Kadok follow Astolfo's path, finally reaching the Righteous Realm. In the presence of what they first believed to be Charles the Great, Kadok requests aid in rescuing Ritzka. Fortunately, such an operation was already in the works. Turns out, the servants currently watching over Ritzka happen to be spies who, at the right moment, will break them out. Now, Salome isn't an idiot. She's fully aware that she's cursed to see her loved ones as Yohanan and eventually desire their severed heads. Still, she enjoys being with Ritzka enough that she desperately tries to remind herself that they aren't Yohanan. 
She gets permission from the guards to escort Ritsuka to the kitchen, where they prepare Kikeon together. We share a bonding moment over this meal, such that when the spies come to break us out, we take an extra second to scarf down the food and thank Salome for it. She finds this so touching that she's willing to aid in Ritsuka's escape. One after another, the spies sent to rescue Ritsuka sacrifice themselves to buy the others time. This gets us out of the castle, across the surrounding plains, and into a nearby forest. There, Salome protects us in battle against Hassan of a Hundred Faces, but starts to succumb to temptation. After Ritsuka gets severely wounded, Salome asks for their head. Ritsuka, however, begs for life, claiming they still have an important job to do. Salome believes that saints, like John the Baptist, don't fear death, so this snaps her out of her delirium long enough to carry Ritsuka out of the revenge realm. With Astolfo in the distance ready to receive them, Salome is suddenly shot by a bullet from Sugitani Zenjubo. The impact shatters her spirit core, and she accepts this knowing that the best way to keep Ritsuka safe would be to distance herself. Succumbing to her wound, Salome passes away, glad that she was able to maintain self-control in the face of temptation. In the end, all of the spies, as well as Salome, give their lives so that Ritsuka can be reunited with the party once more. In secret, the fake Charles reveals to Caldea his true identity as Don Quixote. He also admits he needs Caldea's help, since his righteous realm isn't strong enough to take on the others in a fair fight. To resolve this singularity, we have to work together and obtain the other two Holy Grails from each of the other armies. That night, Kadok speaks in private to Ritsuka and Mashu over the intercom regarding the potential traitor among Caldea's ranks. He suspects Sherlock, but has no real evidence to go from. Ritsuka and Mashu, however, have faith in their allied detective. To prevent them from harboring any doubts, they agree to have Kadok block their memory of their discussion. The next morning, Ritsuka finds out that Seton, aka Charlemagne, also escaped from the Revenge Realm and is hiding out in the Righteous Realm for a time. I guess now's still not the right time for him to reveal his identity. Instead, our party is assigned to a small, elite unit, including Deermud and Shu Fu. This group, the Carl Commandos, sneaks into Shanten Tower, one of a handful of towers the Revenge Realm erected along the border. We don't know it yet, but these towers are meant to be vantage points for Minamoto no Tametomo to fire from. Thus, we return to Don Quixote after stopping by a concealed safe house. Knowing the enemy means business, Caldea asks for Don Quixote's help in recovering their lost servant Vlad. Sancho reveals that their noble phantasm should be able to break Vlad out of his spiky confinement. As such, Don Quixote entrusts Roland with pretending to be Charles while heading out to where they last left Vlad. Specifically, the Triste Suave Alonso Quiano neutralizes Vlad's mystery, allowing him to wake up and rejoin the party. While it's great that he's back, the process of reviving him wasn't entirely successful. He's not strong enough to take to the battlefield personally, but he can, however, train and lead the Righteous Realm's military. Through firm instruction, he's able to get the realm's scattered servants to think as a team, and starts out by proving his worth in a mock battle. After deliberation, Vlad thinks Zhang Zhue is the one behind the artillery towers, and fearing their imminent use, he recommends sending a small force to assassinate Zhang Zhue, while their main army serves as a distraction. That force is basically the same group as before, this time accompanied by a nameless assassin class servant. We decide to ambush Zhang Jue when he leaves the capital for Fort Azagu. Shu Fu's Taoist arts help dismantle the fort's security, allowing us to slip in and find Zhang Jue plotting his betrayal of Creamhield. While he admires her thirst for vengeance, he lacks faith in her sanity, being a berserker and all. This fortress is hiding Siegfried, and he can't even let his guards know the truth. As a result, he's stuck relying on his special yellow turban automatons to fight us. For as powerful as Zhang Jue is with his magecraft, Sherlock is able to throw him off guard with a single revelation. Recall that this isn't Jue's actual body, but rather a clone. Confronted with this reality, he crumbles apart, an unfortunate consequence of his whole cloning ordeal. The fort itself collapses along with him, prompting us to return back to our realm. 
We had to escape before getting the chance to discover Siegfried in the basement. Sure enough, a new Zhang Jue appears before Kriemhild, though he lacks his previous clone's memories. Sancho prepares a banquet for our return, and when Ritsuka retires for the night, they encounter Moriarty in their dream. He demands Ritsuka join his cause, but upon rejection, vows to destroy the Righteous Realm. As if responding to that threat, Johanna at the Reinstatement Realm receives a revelation that they will achieve victory over the Righteous Realm if they attack now. This is supported by the suspicion surrounding Charles's legitimacy. Constantine follows up by declaring war, daring Charles to face him on the battlefield. Refusing this would stunt the Righteous Realm's loyalty, so we accept while trying to renegotiate the appointed location. Constantine would obviously want us out of the mountains to fight on a flat plain, but Vlad visits the reinstatement realm as an ambassador, helping to find a compromise at Sirmium, a spot between both realms. Earlier, Sherlock took a bet that this would be their ultimate venue, and so the Righteous Realm went there in advance to fortify the city. Don Quixote plans to join the fight this time, which means somebody else needs to pretend to be Charles. Ritsuka volunteers for the role and gets a spiffy new mystic code to commemorate the occasion. By remaining within a veiled cart, we can use voice-changing magecraft to fool our own army. Still, it's up to us to be convincing in both speech and body language. Thankfully, after the battle begins, Ritsuka can occasionally venture out in disguise as an ordinary caster servant. It's kinda weird. We are the only one who can summon shadow servants, yet Vlad has convinced our army that we aren't a master. If the truth got out, we'd be screwed, as much of the Righteous Realm still thinks they're rebelling against human history. Even though we've avoided having to actually show Charles's face, we still need to win the battle itself. Sirmium's west gate is guarded by Roland and Astolfo. The eastern gate is protected by a Taoist spell Shu Fu set up that isolates enemy troops for easy picking. This works well for a while, but eventually our lack of numbers takes its toll. Constantine is able to keep sending troops well into the night, and his casters wind up dismantling Shu Fu's spell. Johanna and Bradamante lead an assault from the north. Even as a fake pope, Johanna's orders are like divine commandments. Holding her off keeps Sherlock busy, so when the East Gate starts catching fire, Ritsuka has to go protect it. We struggle, since it's just us and Shu Fu against an especially motivated Kiyohime. She's not a fan of us, seeing us as liars regarding the real Charles. Luckily, Constantine winds up being a liar too. He prematurely informs Kiyohime via an assassin that the West Gate has already fallen. It's meant to crush our morale on the eastern side, but Ritsuka calls his bluff. Not wanting to serve a liar, Kiyohime backs off, resigning from the battle altogether. How convenient. Too bad the eastern gate is still too damaged to save. Learning this, Vlad reluctantly decides the Righteous Realm needs to retreat. We've lost. When Don Quixote offers to help their army escape, Sancho gets a different idea. For as much as Quixote wants to redeem himself for running from Atlantis, Sancho's goal all this time has been to keep him safe. Thus, she binds Vlad, taking him hostage as a bargaining chip for Constantine. She waltzes right up to the enemy and surrenders, hoping that by offering Vlad as a prisoner, she can get Don Quixote's life spared. Constantine even agrees to these terms, but Don Quixote himself won't stand for it. Like the short, spunky boss he is, he declares himself a servant of proper human history and challenges Constantine to a duel. He stands absolutely no chance, but his bravery and stoicism in the face of defeat is admirable, enough so that Seton, the real Charlemagne, finally decides to make his appearance. In an epic reveal, Charlie saves Don Quixote with his noble phantasm, which rivals Constantine's otherwise impregnable defense. Thus, Constantine and his nearby forces retreat, allowing us to escape. Bradamante, despite catching glimpse of her true king during life, still feels like supporting Johanna. Charlemagne's actually cool with this, even if it makes them enemies. Also, knowing Sancho is only trying to protect her lord, Vlad forgives her. The Righteous Realm regroups in the mountains, desperately trying to salvage as many loyal servants as possible. 
After all, they should realize that without proper human history, none of them will even exist. The only reason they're being this stupid is because of their master's influence. We're especially vulnerable right now, but luckily, after seeing both her opponents weakened from the fight, Creamhield decides to target the reinstatement realm. She mobilizes Minamoto no Tametomo, who fires off an arrow aimed at Yohana. In truth, though, her real target is Constantine, whom she knows will take the hit for her. Apparently, from what I've read, Constantine's noble phantasm won't protect fictional heroes. I wonder if that's enforced in the gameplay. By exploiting this, Tametomo's arrow slips past the three-layered wall toward Johanna, only to strike Constantine instead. The strike is fatal, so Constantine uses his final moments to announce the reinstatement realm's downfall. He advises his soldiers to join either of the remaining realms, as anyone still allied with him will die when he does. As expected, most of the servants join Creamhild, though at least some of them join our cause as a result. Bradamante drags Johanna, kicking and screaming, to our realm, as it was Constantine's final wish. At the same time, Kadok finds it odd that we never finished exploring Fort Azagu. He gets permission to go there on his own, and oddly enough, Moriarty shows up wanting to help him. Seems Moriarty's got a soft spot for Kadok, and we've really got nothing to lose by accepting aid. After all, Moriarty already knows everything Kadok could reveal anyway. At best, Kadok will be the one scoring valuable info. That said, Kadok refuses to form a contract with Moriarty, vowing he will only ever have one servant. Aww. Surprisingly, Moriarty plays nice, ultimately helping Kadok free Siegfried from his captivity. Even though his wife is alive and well in this singularity, Siegfried understands he owes his allegiance to humanity. That means making an enemy of his wife, who now has a second Holy Grail recovered from Constantine's demise. It doesn't take long for Creamhild to learn of Siegfried's arrival, and immediately plans for an all-out attack. Even though we now have the real Charlemagne on our side, he insists Ritzka continue playing the role of Emperor. We are totally not ready for the upcoming battle, but fortunately Bradamante and Johanna are up to joining us. We just have to prove our superiority in combat first. Having secured their aid, Vlad reasons our best way to win this war is by avoiding a full-on confrontation, once again sending a smaller unit to assassinate Creamhield. Before the big operation, Charlemagne has a talk with Johanna about their true identities. In a sense, Charlemagne is in a similar situation. His incarnation isn't the side of Carl who actually lived, but rather a symbol of fabricated stories embellishing Carl's achievements. He's not beat up about it though, because he understands the importance of people's wish for heroes. Even if Johanna never truly existed, there's meaning in the fact that people wished she did. Even as a mere story, she gave others hope. This logic's like something right out of Recreators, which is awesome. This helps soothe Johanna's insecurities. Now, she's hell-bent on getting revenge on Creamhild for killing her beloved Constantine. Bradamante helps her realize that she actually had feelings for him, separate from her duty as the Pope. Although Siegfried is on board for the operation, he makes one request of Ritzka, that after Creamhild no longer poses a threat, he'd like to join her side in a final battle. For once, he wants to prioritize her over his duty as a hero. Fair enough. That said, by far, the greatest obstacle in our way is Tametomo. Siegfried, immortal as he is, can endure some of these arrows and repel them with Balmung. The key to victory, though, is finding a way to separate Tametomo from his artillery tower. Luckily, we've got just the person to make it happen. Astolfo, on his hippogriff, soars to the tower and unleashes the trap of Argalia. Sadly, he knows this is a suicide mission and goes out bravely. His lance severs Tametomo's connection to the tower, causing both of them to perish while commending each other's efforts. Our favorite femboy would have died prematurely, if not for a blessing bestowed on him from Johanna. Roland also says his goodbyes when staying behind to help us breach the castle gate. He too is blessed with immortality, 
and offers that up to his sword Durendal in hopes of commanding the gate to open. When this isn't enough, he sacrifices not only his life, but everyone's memories of him to perform a miracle. This lets us proceed to the heart of Creamhield's territory. The next person to block our path is Zhang Jue, the second one, that is. Ritzka, Kadok, Siegfried, and Charlie press on, while Sherlock and the others remain to fight Jue. In the final stretch, an unnamed assassin targets Ritzka, but Kadok leaps in to take the hit. Reluctantly, he admits that Ritzka has the potential to save humanity. Just before incurring a fatal blow, however, he's suddenly saved by a wave of ice that freezes Assassin and the hallway. He learns that V, on Anastasia's orders, is still around to protect him. Once more, Kiyohime stands before us, but this time she actually wants to help. When Ritsuka answers honestly their intent to destroy this singularity, she helps clear a path with her flames. Even without a proper contract, it seems Kiyohime still sees Ritsuka as her beloved Anchin. Outside, the rest of our party struggles against Zhang Jue. They receive unexpected aid when Sugitani Zenjubo starts sniping Jue's allies from afar. Just like in her legend, though, she fails to assassinate her target and is killed by Jue's counterattack. That said, she was able to cause enough of a distraction for Don Quixote and Bradamante to combine their noble phantasms and slay Jue for the second time. In solitude, Sugitani passes on, with her valiant sacrifice mostly overlooked. I feel she deserved more screen time, don't you? At long last, it's time for Siegfried and Kriemhild to duke it out. Although Kriemhild isn't a seasoned warrior, her power is boosted by two holy grails. Her demonic Balmung holds its own against Siegfried's, but to turn the tide, Kadok asks V to transfer its mystic eyes over to Siegfried. These mystic eyes of clairvoyance specialize in exploiting an enemy's weakness, allowing Siegfried to anticipate her wife's attacks. Although Kriemhild uses this bout to vent her frustrations, her feelings of abandonment she eventually loses, expelling both of her grails. Ritzka then retrieves these grails and gives Siegfried the okay to support her. This comes as a complete shock to Kriemhild, who is convinced her husband never truly loved her. He always used to put the lives of others before the commitment he made to her. To apologize and atone, Siegfried now stands by her for one last fight. Her madness soothed, Kriemhild joins her husband in an impossible, yet meaningful battle. Having lost, the two hold hands as they vanish from the singularity. Ritzka has successfully gathered all three grails, and while many of the servants vanish as expected, the singularity itself still remains. That's when Moriarty arrives, and declares that it never really mattered which of the three realms won this war. It was all merely a precursor to his showdown with Sherlock. Perhaps to set the mood, Moriarty has recreated Reichenbach Falls, where his older self fought and died against Sherlock. In the original story, the two of them plunged down the falls together, and while Moriarty drowned, Sherlock wound up surviving. Let's just say that Moriarty doesn't plan to make the same mistake twice. Even though we still have Charlemagne with us, Sherlock requests a one-on-one -on -one duel. Of course, Holmes doesn't stand a chance, not while Moriarty manipulates fate itself in his favor. Regardless, it's a confrontation that needs to happen. Sherlock finally solves the mystery of his own master. He deduces he's an apostle of the alien god, and in defiance, he reveals the trick behind Moriarty's invulnerability before casting himself over the cliff. Now that he's recalled the truth, it seems dying is the only way he can keep helping Caldea. As he gets lost in the raging rapids, he expresses his joy for being part of Ritzka's team and declares they will triumph over the alien god. Having finally defeated his rival, Moriarty explains that he wants to take over Caldea for himself, specifically by using Kadok as his master. Once again, though, Kadok refuses, choosing violence in the face of such a ridiculous proposition. Charlemagne prepares to fight by himself, but then Mashu shows up. Maintenance on her Orton axe is complete, and she ray shifts just in time for this chapter's epic finale. Kadok uses up the last of V's protection to grant Mashu its mystic eyes. 
This, in turn, lets Mashu see the Norns' threads of fate. By severing them, Charlemagne can now defeat Moriarty. We smack him silly, and on his deathbed, he begs for mercy. He's already lost and will soon disappear, but offers to use his remaining time to show us something extremely important. Ritzka, Gordolf, and Mashu all agree to hear him out. This chapter ends on a cliffhanger. Moriarty leads us to the heart of this singularity, the hidden ruins of Area 51. Along the way, we pass by Zhang Jue's main body, which has been reduced to a petrified husk. Behind him is some kind of interstellar corridor that leads to the cause of it all, Specimen E. After getting a good look at this thing, the screen fades to black, and we're left waiting for the next episode to find out what happens. As far as I'm aware, Lost Belt 7 proper is that next chapter, but I could be wrong. It should be dropping for North America by the end of this year. As usual, I'll stream it first, and then produce a lore video just like this one. I can safely say that Lost Belt 7 is not the end of this narrative, giving us plenty to look forward to. Be sure to watch all of my other videos in the meantime. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy this channel, help us grow by liking, commenting, sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all our anime lore, discussions, and let's play content. You can support us directly through Patreon, Subscribestar, or a YouTube membership, all of which come with benefits like spicy exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate, celebrate your, your fandom! fandom. I want to give a special shout out to all my $10 and up supporters. Video Gamer 75, Dante Pendragon, Lunar Works, Steven Elak, Samuel Gersten, The Nonchalant Ostrich, Otaku Mom, Jens Bauman, Mystic Samurai 1983, Lord Ormagodem, Free Brick, Alexis Yukio Gomez Yamato, Link Pendrago, Observer Bellis, James Hewitt, Uncanny EXP, Zamas Autonomous, Yuki Eidos, Scout, Crow Kalem, Sal Soto, Tristan Riggin, Major, Meifu Mado, Caitlin P, Sogai CH, Vladimirovna, The Taz 96, Jonathan Padua, Kengo X 77, Hersha of E Rated Hands, Alester Bernadotte, and Akakaze Yume. Thank you all so much!